Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the MIDA seminar. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Vicky Bogan from uh, Economics and Management at Cornell University. Vicky is the founder and director of the Institute for Behavioral and Household Finance at Cornell. Uh, her research has been focusing on financial economics, behavioral finance, and applied micro. And um, she's published in top econ, both econ and finance journals, and has been doing some very interesting research at the cutting edge of behavioral finance. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to just hand, hand this over to Vicky. Um, so the, the, for the, if you have questions, go ahead and use the raise hand button at the, at the bottom, and then um, we'll, we'll call out, and then uh, Vicky will just let you raise your, your question in the middle of the talk. Go ahead, Vicky, get, get started. So let me kick it off by sharing my screen. Yeah. So can everybody see my screen? We're good? Yeah. Yes. So I just wanted to thank, thank you, Yan, and thank you for inviting me to present virtually at this Midas seminar. Um, I'm excited to be here. And I have to say, I really enjoyed uh, all of the meetings that I had today, uh, learning, talking to everybody in your department. Um, I had a lot of fun and learned a lot. So um, I'm really enjoying my virtual visit. And so most of my research, um, Yan mentioned a little bit, my general research areas, most of my research uh, is in the area of investment decision-making behavior. And so we all know that people don't make decisions in the way that most theoretical finance models say they should. And what I do is I focus on factors like market frictions, transaction costs, behavioral biases, and household characteristics, um, and try to understand how they actually influence investment decision-making behavior in a way that isn't incorporated in the models. And so, you know, I feel like it's important to understand the factors that are actually influencing financial decisions and what information is relevant. And so today I want to talk about financial decision making and mental health. I'd like to start um, by going through uh, a few of my published papers and then get into a basically a hot off the press working paper that I have. All the papers that I'm gonna to discuss today are in the theme of financial decision-making and mental health, whether it's a mental health issue, um, experiencing trauma, um, a negative type of emotion, all of it is how do these types of issues influence mental, uh, influence financial decision-making behavior. And so just to kick off, um, what we know from, the literature when we think about financial decision making and health more broadly, um, we know that numerous aspects of household financial decision making are influenced by health factors. And so I think the first and kind of the seminal paper in this area was the Rosen and Wu JFE paper that um, documented that poor health households are less likely to hold risky assets or certain types of asset classes. And that's kind of the first seminal paper. It was followed up by a host of other papers uh, like the Berkowitz paper that I list here that shows that physical health, uh, a physical health shock actually causes households uh, to restructure their portfolios by reducing stock holdings. But what I focused on investigating and analyzing in a particular area of my research for the past, uh, I guess almost 10 years is looking at the relationship between financial decisions and not physical health, but mental health. And one of the reasons why I've been focusing so much in this area is that mental health conditions are really prevalent in the US population. The National Institute of Mental Health reports that mental health issues affect over 55 million people, nearly one fourth of the adult US population. And we all know from this pandemic, according to the CDC, COVID has actually increased the prevalence of mental health related issues in the population. And so I think it's becoming even increasingly more important to understand the connection between mental health and household finances and mental health and financial decisions in general. <clears throat> 
So the very first paper that I did that addressed this issue was a paper called Portfolio Choice in Mental Health, which was published in the Review of Finance. And it was really my first step in trying to understand how mental health affects household portfolio composition. And so the graphic there just um, in a kind of joking manner says my finances and emotions are connect are Siamese twins attached at the Dow, but it's really um, designed to highlight the connection between mental health, mental health issues and how people manage it, their finances. And so in this paper, Portfolio Choice and Mental Health, we focused on two main empirical questions. What we wanted to look at is really the an extensive margin of asset market participation. So looking at how mental health issues, do they exert an independent effect on whether or not households hold a particular type of asset, be it a safe asset or a risky asset. And the other main sort of set of questions um, were around the intensive margin of asset market participation. How do mental health issues affect the household share of total financial assets allocated to a particular asset class? And so in this work, um, we looked at mental health issues and we kind of grouped them into two broad classifications. One were, uh, one classification is kind of mood and emotion related issues. And for those, we used measures of depression and anxiety. We also measure, used a measure of um, mental health, having, having had a mental health diagnosis. And then we also looked at cognitive abilities. So cognitive limitations and um, self-rated memory status variables. And so in this work, we pulled seven waves of the health and retirement survey data, and we used various mental health measures from the HRS to look at this connection between uh, mental health issues uh, for an individual and the intensive and extensive margin of asset um, market participation. Uh, for these mental health measures, we used these four different ones. One was a mental health diagnosis variable in the HRS, they ask respondents if they've ever been diagnosed with an emotional, nervous, or psychiatric problem by a doctor. Um, they, have very, they have questions that allow you to calculate a CES depression score, and I'll be really precise about what that is in a, in a few slides. And they also have questions that allow you to calculate a cognitive limitation score, and they have a self-rated memory score. And in this paper, what we're really trying to look at is, um, this is just the raw data, so unconditional correlations, but really the connection between these um, measures of mental health and how they're connected with both the um, um, percent holding of safe assets and risky assets. In terms of the identification strategy for this work, we think about the extensive margin uh, for trying to understand this relationship, we used logit and conditional fixed effect logit models to try to examine the effect of mental health on the probability of holding a particular type of asset. And by type of asset, I mean either a safe asset like a transaction account, um, a savings or checking account or bonds or risky assets. By that, I mean stocks and mutual funds. And these are assets outside of a retirement account. And so we're looking at uh, this relationship where you know, the dependent variable of interest is holding a particular type of asset and the independent variable of interest is one of the four lagged measures of mental health that I mentioned before. For the analysis of the extensive margin of asset market participation, we use TOBIT and conditional fixed effect TOBIT models to examine the effect of mental health on the share of total financial assets that are allocated to a particular asset class. So of all of your total financial assets, what percent are allocated to risky assets? Or of all of your total financial assets, what percent are allocated to safe assets? And so again, that is our dependent variable of interest and our independent variables of interest represent one of the four measures of lagged mental health. Now, obviously, we're 
in this work, we're attempting to establish a causal connection and there are empirical challenges with that. I mean, there's obviously this issue of reverse causality. We're making the case, we're trying to understand how do mental health issues affect um, investment in particular types of assets, but you could say, well, Vicki, it could be the case that investing in certain types of assets could cause mental health issues. And so we try to address these impair of these reverse causality issues um, by using fixed effect models, using lag mental health variables, controlling for things like financial distress, separating in, uh, samples by couple status. And so we try, um, we, we do a number of different things to address these issues of reverse causality and also address um, many confounding factors that you may be thinking of, like the fact that maybe it's the case that mental health issues lead to additional medical expenses, which influence wealth, which causes people to make different investment choices. And so we also, um, in this work, address a lot of the confounding factors um, that are some of the empirical challenges that we had with this work. The main findings for this particular um, paper is that households affected by mental health issues decrease investments in risky instruments. Various mental health issues can reduce the probability of holding risky assets by up to 19 percentage points, which is very significant. Um, it's, st it's statistically and also economically significant um, with regard to the wealth implications that has for wealth accumulation for households. And we also see that um, for single women diagnosed with psychological disorder, this increased investment in safe assets. And so that was really our first kind of uh, foray into this um, area where we're looking at the intersection of financial decision making and um, health, mental health issues. Um, our next step along that progression was a paper um, looking at mental health and retirement savings, which was published in Health Economics. And this is again, joint work with um, one of my co-authors, um, Angela Fertig, who's at University of Minnesota, where we really drill down and try to look at how mental health influences retirement savings decisions. Why do we focus on retirement savings? Well, when you think about household wealth, retirement, you know, other than your home, retirement accounts are sort of the largest percent um, portion of wealth for most households. And so we wanted to look at how mental health could actually influence retirement savings decisions. This is a big and important question for most households. With regard to this literature, we focus on kind of three classes of um, empirical questions. Um, again, we're interested in the extensive margin of participation in these voluntary contribution retirement accounts. And so I wanna be really clear the distinction that we make. These are voluntary contribution, re voluntary contribution retirement accounts. So they're 401k accounts, 403b accounts, um, IRAs or uh, KEO accounts if you're self-employed. These are not defined benefit pension accounts, which are automatic and don't um, aren't voluntary in the same way. And so we want to look at how mental health issues could exert an uh, effect on the probability of participating in a 401k plan. Uh, we also want to look at how mental health issues could affect the share of total financial assets allocated to your um, 401k plan. And then we also, are, in this work, we look at how mental health issues affect retirement account values, as well as withdrawals from the retirement account. And so for this study, uh, we ambitiously decided to use two different large panel data sets, in addition to pooling seven waves of the health and retirement survey to look at this question, we also use the PSID, the panel study of income dynamics. The reason why we like to use both of them, obviously the health and retirement survey has great data, but that is focused on older cohort of individuals. Uh, we wanted to use the panel of uh, PSID in addition because it's a more um, representative sample in terms of various age cohorts. Another aspect of using these two data sets that was beneficial for us is that they um, have different um, metrics 
for uh, mental health, mental health measures, and it allows us to kind of test the robustness of our findings. Uh, for this particular work, we focus on one aspect of mental health. Specifically, we look at depression and anxiety, which um, in the health economics literature, they refer to this as psychological distress. Um, one of the reasons we focus on depression and anxiety, um, instead of using one of the metrics like, have you ever been diagnosed with a mental health disorder by a doctor, is because um, depression and anxiety uh, these questions aren't connected to socioeconomic status in the same way that getting a mental health diagnosis from a doctor does. So I see there's a question. Uh, actually, I have a question. <laughs> I hope it's okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I was wondering whether there are um, correlations between mental health and uh, risk preferences or loss. You know, are people more loss averse uh, or risk averse when they when they have um, you know, depression or anxiety, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how, whether that actually affects their preferences in some way. Yeah, so I have two answers to that. So that's a great question. I have two answers to that. Um, in this paper, we actually have a theoretical model um, that's based on um, acknowledgement that um, things like depression and anxiety could make you more risk averse. Um, and so it's changing your risk preferences. What we cannot rule out is that depression and anxiety could actually influence your discounting because there is literature to suggest that people with mental health issues um, uh, discount differently or they discount the future more. And so when we're thinking about retirement savings behavior, um, in this paper, the theoretical model acknowledges that it could be either through the risk aversion mechanism or the discounting mechanism that mental health is affecting one of those um, and correspondingly influencing retirement savings decisions. Unfortunately, with um, both the HRS and the PSID, they don't have really good data on um, collecting um, over time on risk aversion and discount rates. And so in the PSID, for example, the last time they asked a question about risk aversion was in 1996. And so they haven't carried that question through um, the waves that we use that have the appropriate mental health measures. So we start these samples in like 2001 in the PSID because that's when they started collecting these mental health measures, um, but they didn't simultaneously do the risk measures. So um, that's something you know, that we theoretically think is one of the mechanisms that could be um, operating this channel. And so um, thank you for that question that helped me explain. Um, some of the theoretical model that I really won't have a chance to get into, but we focus on this one aspect of mental health, depression and anxiety, because we can construct the measure from the questions that are asked in the survey and we don't have to rely on a kind of noisy measure that is correlated with um, income and wealth in terms of getting a doctor's diagnosis. Um, as I said, the HRS and the PSID uh, use different measures for psychological distress, which we find um, is important because it uh, justifies or um, so kind of substantiates the um, validity or the robustness of our findings. That's a better way to say that. The HRS measure is the CES depression score variable that's created by summing responses to eight questions um, about feelings experienced much of the time during the past week. The score ranges from zero to eight. High score means more depressed. And from this measure, this metric that we collect, that they collect in the HRS, we can create a dummy variable that's set to one if the score is four or higher and zero otherwise. And so according to kind of the robust health economics literature, this score has been analyzed and vetted and they've identified these cutoffs for indication of psychological distress or not. And so that score cutoff is not from our work, it's um, consistent with the literature that I've cited there. The PSID uses a slightly different measure for uh, psychological distress. It's called the K6 score that's created by summing responses to six questions about feelings experienced for much of the time during the past 30 days. 
And so this score ranges from zero to 24. Again, a high score means more depressed. The interesting thing about this score is there's a literature to um, guide us into how we can use the score to classify people in terms of levels of psychological distress. And so the literature indicates that if somebody has a score of 13 or higher, they have severe psychological distress. If they have a score between five and 12 inclusive, they have moderate psychological distress. And so we use this information to construct um, two different dummy variables to measure different types of different um, levels of psychological distress. And so what we're after in this particular paper is trying to understand the relationship between these K6 score and the CESD score um, and the probability of holding a retirement account and the probability and the um, percent of assets held, uh, percent of retirement savings as a share of total financial assets. Our identification strategy is somewhat similar to the one uh, from the previous paper where we look at the extensive margin of retirement account, voluntary retirement account participation through LOGIT and conditional fixed effect LOGIT models. Again, we're using the same um, lagged mental health variables and the same controls to address the concerns regarding uh, reverse causality and the confounding factors that I uh, articulated earlier. We look at the intensive margin of participation with TOBIT and conditional fixed effect TOBIT models. We actually add in this paper looking at actual account values, so the absolute level of, um, of um, funds in your retirement account and withdrawal behavior. And so um, how you withdraw, how much you withdraw. What we find in this paper, um, we find results consistent with the theoretical model that I briefly mentioned a few slides ago that um, our theoretical model predicts that mental health issues could cause households to in decrease investments in illiquid assets like retirement accounts. And it could be through one of the two mechanisms that I described earlier, either um, affecting the discount rate or levels of risk aversion. What we find empirically is that generally depression and anxiety reduce the probability of ownership by up to 24 percentage points and can reduce the share of assets devoted to retirement accounts by as much as 67 percentage points. So these are uh, significant effects statistically, but also economically. We find that depression and anxiety are correlated with lower account values overall, and that depression and anxiety increase the probability of withdrawals, increase, increase withdrawal values as a share of financial assets, um, and um, increase the absolute withdrawal values. And so, um, just taking the time, the last kind of overview paper that I want to mention today is where we kind of move a little bit or um, kind of in this evolution of sort of looking at the connection between financial decisions and mental health issues is I wanted to look at the effect of trauma and how experiencing something traumatic could affect your have long-term effects on risk-taking behavior with regard to your household portfolio. And so we wanted to look to see if experiencing trauma affects risk-taking behavior. And so for this particular study that I'll only um, describe briefly, we wanted to look to see if a personal traumatic experience and our proxy for a personal traumatic experience was the combat experience of veterans. We wanted to see if that had a long-term effect on risky stockholding behavior. And so with this particular paper, we used the combat experience of veterans and we had a proprietary data set of World War II veterans. The reason why we focused on World War II veterans is because that was a war that had a draft and the evidence suggests that whether or not you were assigned to combat was randomly determined. And so in terms of the identification strategy for this paper, we have a pool of veterans that in World War II, some of them were randomly assigned to be uh, in combat and some of them weren't. And so we 
I can identify in this pool of World War II veterans that responded to the survey, which ones were assigned to combat, had combat experience, and which ones didn't. And then we compared their um, portfolio allocations kind of in the present day. And we found that relative to the veterans that didn't experience combat, the ones that did experience combat had decreased um, risky asset holding. And so combat was associated with a you know, 0.14 to 1.17 uh, decrease in the probability of holding risky assets. And this is in contrast to the fact that we looked at their combat experience effect on safe assets and we found no effect on the safe assets, um, but we did find this uh, effect of kind of trauma through um, being experienced to combat having uh, an effect on risky asset holding. And so this is the work that kind of the next step leads, led me to kind of the next step along my research agenda journey um, to look at um, trauma in another uh, context and another perspective. And so in general, up until this point in time, I'm really taught looking at kind of these mental health issues and um, psychological distress and trauma and how it influences um, risky asset holding behavior. You know, to me, these are important questions because they shed light on sort of another factor which helps explain a lot of the large unexplained portion of cross-sectional variation in portfolio choice for households. Um, and it also has significant implications when we think about the importance of risky asset holding for wealth building and wealth accumulation. Um, what I wanna do now is look at um, trauma uh, and trauma that causes kind of fear and how it affects risk. And so this is very recent work. This is actually the first time that I've presented this uh, paper outside of Cornell, outside of kind of our local brown bags. And so I would be very appreciative of any com comments or feedback that you have because this is such kind of hot off the press sort of work. Um, but the idea in this work is to try to understand if sort of negative emotions or visceral factors that elicit or generate fear actually have an influence on risk-taking behavior. And this is joint work with one of my finance colleagues at um, the College of Business at Cornell, Scott Yonker. And so for this work, I do wanna take a little bit more time of going through some of the details of this work, um, talk about kind of the motivation and how we're trying to frame this work, uh, establish our research questions, give you the findings and talk about our identification strategy um, data and analysis. So when we think about the motivation of this paper beyond just kind of my general uh, research strand looking at this connection between financial decisions and mental health. We know that, again, rational agent models don't explain um, many key features of financial markets that we consistently observe. And so there's some well-established puzzles in the finance literature, puzzles like high volatility in asset prices, large equity premium, counter cyclical nature of expected risk premiums um, that aren't well explained by traditional theoretical finance models. Systematic time varying risk preferences have been identified as a potential key to try to reconcile some of these puzzles. And there are a lot of theoretical models that feature counter-cyclical risk-taking that can explain these patterns. And they've been developed to, that help to explain some of the puzzles that I mentioned. And so what we wanna do with this um, line of research is to provide some compelling, direct, real-world empirical evidence of a channel or a mechanism that could cause counter-cyclical risk-taking in support of some of these traditional models. Now, within the finance literature, recent empirical work does document evidence consistent with counter-cyclical financial risk-taking. And so I just wanna you know, highlight the uh, Guiso et al. paper, that's a JFE paper that finds that after the 2008 uh, financial crisis, both 
qualitative and quantitative measures of risk aversion increased and affected individuals, individuals affected by the um, crisis divested more stock. Um, they also indicate that the channel for this is not changes in wealth or expected income. And they indicate that they think it's fear um, that's causing um, them to decrease their risk taking. Uh, just also wanted to highlight the, the Necker paper, which also studies the 2008 crisis. Um, and they use German data um, and found that households that um, attributed losses to the crisis, they decreased risk, they have decreased risk tolerance and um, decreased planned risk taking. And so we have kind of this um, suggestive evidence, uh, but kind of the channel causing investors to reduce risk has been difficult to identify up until this point. One of the proposed channels, so one promising channel that's been put forth is this idea of negative emotions or visceral factors. And so these visceral factors may be able to provide a clue. And so this is in the, the spirit of Lowenstein that, um, that develops, that says that utility can be modeled as state dependent on negative emotions or visceral factors. And so kind of building on that framework, uh, we're thinking that potentially these negative emotions uh, can be influencing risk-taking behavior. And we know, you know, it's been conjectured by both the Guiso et al. paper and the Necker paper, they conjecture that negative emotions were important to decreased risk-taking following the 2007-08 financial crisis beyond any wealth effects. And so that's really what we're trying to, to think about um, and position this work. And so uh, when we consider if negative emotions or visceral factors are important for counter, counter cyclical risk taking, um, there's been a lot of really great work uh, in the experimental setting. Alain has a great AER paper, which I am very fond of, um, where he, um, in the experimental setting, primes investors with market booms or busts and finds that those primed with busts take less risk, and they also report greater fear. Um, he also shows that subjects um, threatened with electrical shocks take risks. So kind of this fear of electrical shock causes you to take less risk. Uh, the Guiso et al. paper, they um, induce fear by showing subjects um, clips from horror movies. Um, and they demonstrate that subjects, subjects that are shown the horror film clips report higher risk aversion. And so we have this, um, really great interesting strand of literature um, in this in experimental context that's linking uh, fear with um, decreased risk taking. There's some other experimental evidence. Uh, Kami Kunin at UNC has some um, neuro, neuroeconomic work that links negative emotions and shows that they can be influential in risk taking. There's also a fair amount of indirect evidence in asset markets that indirectly link investor emotional states with risk taking by documenting that investor moods and emotions are related to stock market fluctuations. And so in this literature, um, like the Sanders um, paper and the Hirschleifer and Shumway paper, they show that stock indices have lower returns on cloudy days um, there are a couple of Kempstra et al. papers that show that stock indices have lower returns when there's reduced um, daylight or when people get less sleep. Um, the Edmonds paper is a really interesting paper that shows that country level stock indices are lower the day after the country's national soccer team is eliminated from the World Cup. And so these are all um, indirect <laughs> Um, links between emotions and investor emotions and stock market fluctuations. And so uh, in addition to that, you know, the experimental evidence, kind of the indirect evidence and link with markets, there's some survey-based literature that has found um, negative exogenous shocks lead to more conservative risk attitudes. And so these are negative shocks 
related to things like war or violence or natural disasters. Um, the issue with some of this literature, um, they're critics of this literature, and I'm not one of the critics, but the critics of these studies argue that these measures aren't necessarily well suited for developed economies um, because they're generally done in a developing economy context, and so they question the external validity. Um, so you have a lot of literature in this general area. I think the open question and the hole that we're trying to fill with this new research is to try to see if we can find evidence that fear affects financial risk taking of actual investors in actual markets. And so we're going to try to get some direct evidence um, that's a, a little um, step forward from the indirect evidence that I talked about. Um, also try to understand uh, what the dynamic effects are so that we can potentially have some um, a potential source of volatility and risk-taking behavior um, because visceral factors are fleeting. And we might be able to say something or contribute to the literature um, on time varying um, preferences, creating some financial puzzles. Now the challenges with what we want to do are, you know, there are a couple of big hurdles to trying to answer this question. We want, we'd have, we need to identify a relatively homogeneous group of investors on which to conduct analysis so that we can really try to isolate the effect. And we also need to identify a randomly assigned treatment that generates fear, but uncorrelated with personal, local, or macroeconomic factors that could also affect risk-taking decisions. And so this is something, you know, we couldn't do something like, you know, the pandemic caused fear because that's correlated with other factors that could affect risk-taking decisions. Um, and that's some of the issue with using the financial crisis that was correlated with factors that could cause risk-taking decisions. And so what we do in terms of our identification strategy is we want to analyze the effect of mass shootings on risk-taking decisions and the risk-taking decisions of US domestic equity mutual fund managers. And so in that way, we have a relatively homogeneous group of investors um, and we have what we think is a um, interesting uh, random fear shock. In terms of preview of the findings, uh, in case I, I'm, I have about 20 minutes left, we document robust evidence that's consistent with fear inducing temporary reductions in financial risk taking relative to non-exposed peers, so peer funds, professional fund managers exposed to a mass shooting event reduce risk following the mass shooting. The reduction of risk is through reductions in systematic risk for those of you finance people, and the managers move into stocks with lower market betas. The magnitude of the effect is actually stronger for mass shooting events with greater fatalities. So those are ones that would generate more fear. The effect is stronger for funds located closer to the shooting, again, greater fear, and for funds run by managers that are ex ante more susceptible to the fear of mass shootings. Additionally, we find that our results are robust to alternative definitions of risk measures, alternative controls and control groups, alternative event horizons, and alternative sources of mass shooting data. Um, just to give you a little, uh, another preview of the findings in, in one slide, um, the, it's important to note that when we consider the implications of our findings, the risk reduction is temporary. It lasts only about one quarter following uh, um, mass shooting. And so that allows us to rule out interpretations like, well, you know, the fund managers are just learning about the market because the effect is temporary. Um, and the implications for a temporary versus a permanent effect are different. A temporary effect is going to induce more, greater market volatility. And if it induces more market volatility, then this serves to better explain the puzzles that I mentioned um, earlier, like the high volatility in asset prices. Yes, there's a... Yes, so it's me again. So <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, you mentioned that the fund managers are relatively homogeneous. 
So what what uh, what are the bases for this? Uh, do you do you look at their demographics or what what is the basis for the um, homogeneity? Um, um, I'm not sure if I I think you you mentioned that they are a relatively homogeneous. They're homogeneous in terms of skill, okay, like literacy, yeah. uh, education, okay, um, and so they are not homogeneous in terms of gender, and we're going to exploit that. Um, in one of our studies, and they're not homogeneous in terms of age or experience. Okay. So those are two, but when we think about a lot of the characteristics that influence your financial decisions, it's going to be literacy, experience, education, um, and so forth. So in that sense, they're homogeneous. And I, I might, I, I think I'll answer your question a little bit better in a few moments when I talk about mass shootings. Yeah, sure. um, so why do we, why are we interested in this question? Uh, what we wanna do, our intended contribution is to document statistically and economically significant evidence that's consistent with fear inducing temporary reductions in financial risk taking. Uh, we wanna provide the first direct empirical evidence that visceral factors, visceral factors affect financial risk taking in an actual market. And so beyond the indirect evidence that we show, we wanna show actual, um, investors making actual market decisions. And then we also want to provide some suggestive evidence that systematic changes in investors' emotional states could exacerbate countercyclical changes in risk taking. So if we can show, okay, this fear causes differences in risk taking, and we know that market downturns induce fear, um, then it could be um, in the future a link to trying to explain some of those puzzles um, in the literature that we've talked about, that I talked about previously. And so let's start, I'm gonna to get to why um, mutual fund managers in a moment, but let's start with why mass shootings. We utilize exposure to mass shootings as a proxy for fear because there's a rich, substantial literature in psychology, in psychology, in criminology that documents that mass shootings actually induce fear. Mass shootings, unfortunately, are relatively frequently, uh, relatively frequent, more frequent than anyone would like. In our sample period um, from first quarter of 1999 to the second quarter of 2016, there were 254 mass shooting events. Mass shootings, by definition, are random. So they're unrelated to gangs, drugs, or organized crime. And they often occur in areas with low crime rates or no prior history of violence. Um, mass shootings are unconstrained by geography. So in our sample, 39 of the lower 48 states have at least one event during our sample period. And so this limits our concern of a correlation between the mass shooting locations and risk preferences of individuals who locate in specific areas. And so you think about that in the context of the other literature that looked at you know, fear or trauma from a natural disaster. Well, you could say that people that want to live in you know, Florida where there are a lot of hurricanes or California where there are a lot of earthquakes um, may have some type of preference that's correlated. Um, but we have limited concern of that because of um, the mass shootings being unconstrained. And we also know that the mass shootings are not correlated with macroeconomic or local economic conditions. Okay. With regard to mutual fund managers, the reason why this is a good sample is that the risk-taking decisions are observable and measurable over long periods of time. They have less heterogeneity in backgrounds. And this was my um, answer to Anne's question earlier in terms of financial literacy and skill sets. Um, with regard to mutual fund managers, they have clearly stated objectives and styles for their investing. And they've been shown to exhibit few behavioral biases, um, so systematic behavioral mistakes. But they have been, there is evidence that these managers do imprint their own preferences on portfolios, despite fiduciary duty and governance mechanisms. And so I, I don't have a ton of time to go through a lot of this, but managers are influenced by things like career concerns and political ideology um, that influence neighboring managers that influence their, um, their, their choices for um, financial decisions. In terms of the data 
Um, we use a lot of different data sources for this. The main mutual fund data come from CRISP and Morningstar Direct. Uh, we have this mass shooting database that's um, it's the SMSA, which is the Stanford Mass Shooting Amer in America database. This is our primary source. This database was developed by the Stanford Geospatial Center at Stanford University. And so they have mass shootings. It's their definition defined as having at least three victims that are unrelated to gangs, drugs, or organized crime. And the database includes dates, number of victims, number of deaths, location, location types, et cetera. There's another source of mass shooting data. It's called the Mother Jones Mass Shooting Database. Um, we focus on the Stanford database because the Mother Jones database covers fewer events. Um, they only cover uh, events that have fatalities with four or more fatalities. So it's a smaller sample, but we do actually use the Mother Jones database to um, provide robustness. So we do all of our analysis in that data set as well, and we find consistent results. Um, then we have to supplement our main data sources with other information like zip codes for distance and um, determining um, mutual fund managers' names. And so we use a lot of other data sources. And so in terms of um, this particular project, what we do is we identify the sample of mass shooting events that we can use. We identify kind of a sample of candidate mutual funds. Um, we determine, you know, within this group of mutual funds, which ones are treated and which ones are control groups for, for each quarter. Um, and then we um, do a couple of processes to ensure that there's no cross-contamination. Our sample period is from first quarter of 1999 to the second quarter of 2016. We do that because the daily returns data is available in CRISP starting in the last quarter of 1998. And the SMSA database is discontinued in July of 2016. So that constrains our sample. Gives us 254 total events. Um, an event is included if you have at least one mutual fund manager that's within 100 miles of the event location. Um, I want to get into that. You know, you know, we have some justification for that 100 mile cutoff, but it's it, it's a little arbitrary. Um, and so we do try to justify it in the paper. Um, we calculate the distance between the zip code, the event zip code and the mutual fund manager zip code. And with that constraint, we have 210 mass shooting events. Just to give you a sample of the events that we're looking at, um, these are the 10 deadliest mass shooting events. I'm sure as you're familiar with, you know, Virginia Tech, Sandy Hook, Columbine um, are all, these are all the events that are in our sample. Um, if you notice, if you look at the third third row, Sandy Hook, it's because it's in Connecticut, it's in, it's close to a lot of mutual fund managers. Um, our, our results are robust, whether or not we include Sandy Hook or not in the data set. And so we've, I'm gonna show you results with Sandy Hook in, but if we take it out, um, our results are robust. This just gives you a picture of the geographic dispersion of mass shootings um, during our sample period. Um, in this graph, the, the little dots are scaled. Um, the larger the, these, these are events that include, um, these are at least one event in each of the 39 um, states. Um, the size of the circle indicates the severity of the shooting by the number of fatalities and events above the median number of fatalities, which is um, four or more, are in black and events that are below the median number of fatalities are the gray dots. Um, just to give you a more um, better sense is a very unusual data set. Um, these are the mass shootings by year during our sample. You see a huge spike um, in overall mass shootings towards the end of the sample period, that is driven mostly by low fatality events, um, but we st still do see an overall upward trend in high fatality events as well. Um, another important kind of picture of the data, oftentimes you think about um, you know, Sandy Hook or Virginia Tech as locations for mass shootings. The majority of the mass shootings are in residential areas. So over 40% of the mass shootings are in residential areas. When you think about 
colleges or universities were um, primary secondary schools. Those are usually about, you know, a little less than 5% each. Um, don't have a ton of time. So um, I won't talk a lot about this, but just to say, you know, we have a pretty robust kind of screening um, process to identify the mutual funds that are included in the sample. What we wanna make sure is that we drop you know, passively managed funds like ETFs, um, we drop small funds so that we can get to funds that are actively managed. And we end up with an average of um, 1,575 funds per quarter. Okay. And so we get these funds that are included in the sample. Um, we calculate the distance between the event and the fund advisor location. We categorize the funds as within 100 miles as treated funds, or in another specification, we do within 50 miles as treated funds. And we categorize all the other funds as control funds. And so what we're doing is where we categorize the funds by fund style. So we're not comparing, we're comparing within specific type of mutual fund group. So, you know, large cap value fund, we look within that type of mutual fund for a particular quarter. We see if there was a mass shooting event. If there was, and you were within a hundred miles of it, then you're classified as treated. If you weren't within a hundred miles of it during that quarter, um, we classify you as untreated. And so we're going to compare the treated and the untreated. We drop any control funds in categories that don't have at least one treated fund. And we also don't want contamination. So we drop funds from a control group that are in the treatment group of another event during the same quarter. And so we really want to try to isolate the effect. Um, we end up with you know, over uh, 146 fund event observations. Uh, these are, well, I only have six minutes, um, summary stats, let me just skip over that and get to our methodology where we use a difference in difference framework to estimate the treatment effect of fear on changes in risk taking. Right? And so our main risk measure is total risk, which we calculate by as the realized total daily volatility as measured um, by the standard deviation of daily excess returns. Um, and our main in, independent variable of interest is this exposure um, measure that indicates if the fund was in, within 100 miles in one model or um, 50 miles in another model. Um, what we find is that um, we estimate our model for the full data set. We, the first two columns are just all the events um, and we don't really find um, any significant effect. Then we bifurcate the sample between low fatality events and high fatality events. And what we find when we bifurcate the sample, and again, high fatality events are ones where um, you have a number of fatalities that is above the median. Um, once we do, we find a strong effect for the high fatality sample. And we find and that, and this makes intuitive sense in that the high fatality sample, high fatalities, are most likely to cause fear. And so when we think about being within either 100 miles or 50 miles of a mass shooting, it causes the mutual fund manager to reduce risk by um, 40 basis points and 60 basis points respect, respectively. What we do next is we look at um, the risk taking, um, decreases in risk taking, by type of uh, risk. And so we decompose our risk measure. So we start with the total risk measure and then we decompose the risk measure um, and try to evaluate if managers are adjusting systematic risk or they're adjusting idiosyncratic risk. And so um, for those non-finance people, um, systematic risk, we estimate, you know, it's, we're estimating market betas by regressing um, daily excess fund returns on daily excess market returns. So that's kind of your sort of exposure to the market. Um, idiosyncratic risk is a standard deviation of residual terms from the systematic risk regressions. 
And what we find when we decompose between um, systematic and idiosyncratic risk is that the um, managers are, de are decreasing systematic risk. And so it's, um, they're decreasing systematic risk by 60 basis points, um, which is about 5% of the standard deviation in changes in the market betas. The last column I'll just mention is we're looking at um, how being exposed to a mass shooting changes tracking error. And that's where we're just trying to test whether the fear is pushing the managers toward uh, to herd towards the market. And so that's why we just test the tracking error measure and we don't find that that's the case. Um, I wanted to touch on this because um, this is where we look at, actually, I want to touch on this um, it, because this um, kind of goes towards one of um, Yan's questions where we're looking at fear and risk taking by manager traits. Um, we know from the literature that um, younger um, people, younger individuals and females um, have stronger fear responses to mass shootings. And so the literature on mass shootings finds that fear effects are stronger for women and younger individuals. And so we actually test that as well. And we test whether the mass shooting is stronger for um, female managers. And so we can look at, um, the proportion of um, female managers times our um, within 50 miles of a mass shooting measure, we do find that um, female managers have a, a stronger, uh, more significant decrease in um, total risk. Um, correspondingly, we look at um, sort of younger managers. We try to proxy for that in a couple of ways. We look at um, manager experience and also manager age. And what we find is um, being within 50 miles of a mass shooting and manager experience, um, the more experience you have, the less likely you're going to, the less you're going to reduce risk. Um, similarly, the older you are um, being exposed to a mass shooting, the less likely you are to reduce risk. And so I manage my time almost well, I'm a couple <laughs> um, minutes off. Uh, I just wanted to mention that we do a lot of robustness checks to check the validity of the randomness assumption, uh, randomness of mass shooting. We check the sensitivity of our, our results to choices for risk measures, controls, control groups, event horizons, data sets, fund styles. Uh, we do a couple of placebo tests and find that um, we don't find the effect with the placebo test. And we also test alternative mechanism for risk reduction um, through fund flows that I don't think I'll be able to talk about. Um, what I did want to, I guess I think I'm at a time at this point, um, but what we are starting to see with this work is we're trying to document this causal effect of fear on risk taking among active mutual fund managers that's consistent with the laboratory findings that we find in some really um, great experimental work that Len has and also the WISO at OWL paper. Uh, we find that the effect is temporary and so it's consistent with utility being represented as, a, as state dependent on visceral factors. And we hope that we can, you know, this result combined with evidence that market downturns induce fear, uh, we hope that our findings can have the potential to help explain um, several empirical finance puzzles. And so I think I'm one minute over, so I apologize for being over. <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. I'm happy to stay around if there are other, if there are any questions. Yeah, I think what we're going to do is if people have questions, so feel free to hang out and uh, or contact Vicky by email. Um, it's a really fascinating stream of research. Thank you. So feel free to um, raise your hand and then um, Well, can they can they just unmute themselves, James? Uh, I'll have to be the one to oh, uh, un see. unmute. Okay. But as you okay. raise your hand, I've got I've I've got everyone. <laughs> okay, me, so. thank you. <laughs> 
Oh, I, I think there's a, oh, Ulrika, um, Ulrika Volstead has her hand raised. Yeah. yeah. Perfect, and Ulrika, you're, you're good to go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. okay. So um, I'm trying to understand the channels that are at work. And one thing I'm wondering about is which kind of information you have about the managers, because, well, I don't even know um, if there's a measure for how good you are at regulating your emotions. But that is something I would think may influence this. Yeah, so we don't have, you know, we have some demographic information on the mutual fund managers, but I, I, I think you're right. Um, that it would be really interesting to see how good you are at regulating your emotions. The only very noisy proxy we have is gender. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do see um, when we look at the funds that have a higher proportion of female managers that they are um, more affected um, mm -hmm. and more likely to reduce the risk. Yeah, but, but I have no idea whether there is a difference in emotion regulation ability regarding gender. So, yeah, I, yeah. I don't, yes, I yeah. mean, what, what I, the literature that, so I, I wouldn't want to speculate. Mm -hmm. What we do know from the literature is that women and younger people are more likely to be, uh, express fear from mm -hmm. mass shootings. And so that's, that's what we have. Mm -hmm. um, what you're suggesting is kind of a, an important second step is, okay, even if they express fears mm -hmm. and maybe they are, are people, are certain people more likely or more able to regulate their fear or their mm -hmm. emotions, um, we don't have that information. So that's yeah. our presentation. Yeah, thank you. Um, anybody else? Um, so I, from my perspective, I don't see any raised hand at this point. So, um, oh yeah, here, uh, Ulrika, uh, did you forget to lower your hands or you, you have a, another question? Uh, it looks, looks like a follow-up here. Let me bring Ulrika back okay. in. Okay, yeah. I, I would have another question, but I don't know what the, the schedule is. So I'm also happy to, to, to let other people ask if there are other questions. Um, so right now I don't see. No, I would say feel, feel free to go ahead. At yeah, this point. go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing that's, um, a very basic question when you started out with your motivation, first you said you're going to talk about mental health and then you said, okay, we'll focus specifically on depression and anxiety. And maybe I just didn't catch it, but um, why are you excluding other things like um, addiction, like substance abuse or eating disorders, or there, there are like many other issues that, that I could imagine could very well influence it, but maybe they are more difficult to measure or I, yeah, that's just more uh, clarifying. Okay, so this is for the retirement paper. Mm -hmm. So in the retirement paper, we do focus just on psychological distress. Um, one of the reasons is, um, we don't have the data on some of those other issues. And so when we were talking about like addiction, I mean, we don't have the same level of data on mm -hmm. some of the other mental health issues. Um, with mental health diagnosis, they do ask a question as to whether or not you've been diagnosed with a mental health disorder by a doctor. Um, we don't use that um, in the retirement, because it's a it's a noisy measure in that it's correlated with wealth, and so people that um, are have higher wealth and income are more likely to have a doctor diagnosis for mental health um, mm -hmm. than other people, and so we felt that the the cleaner way to try to measure psychological distress was through the um, K-6 and the CSD score where the respondent is asked the questions right in the survey. 
Sure, and I mean, if you take only those people who have a doctor's diagnosis, these are the ones already seeking help. Like, I imagine that those that are not going to see a doctor maybe even have worse problems because they don't see yes. a problem. So. No, you're exactly right. So we did a little <laughs> bit of analysis on that. Um, and there's also, there's some gender bias in that as well. So men are less likely to see a doctor for a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. And so if they do have a diagnosis, they generally have a more severe problem. And so um, that's that I forgot to mention that, but thank you for that. That's another reason why the, the mental health diagnosis measure is a little messy. Mm -hmm. In some waves of the, you know, I mean, you raised another very good point. Like there are a lot of mental health issues, you know, in terms of addiction and um, uh, substance use disorders. Um, we don't uh, have a, the same robust amount of data in those different data sets that we do for kind of the K-6 and the CSD score. So we focus on, mm -hmm. um, we have some data limitations, I guess I would say that. Yeah, thank you. Oh, no, thanks for your question. Yeah. Okay, um, other questions? All right, so thank you so much, Vicki. This oh, is wonderful. You. Yeah. Great to see you virtually. <laughs> yes, <laughs> hopefully you the next SSA meeting will be real in yeah, person. Maybe, yeah. maybe you can visit Cornell sometime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would be great. All right, take care. Yeah, yeah, bye-bye. Yeah.